even with high gas prices, but you're here. This is the Lord's Day. Others are coming in, and we want to rejoice. This is, of course, Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we want to pay tribute and honor those that uh, have served and died for the freedoms that we enjoy here in America. I want you to watch this video. When I look back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war and I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves, I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country, I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom one airman who knew the cost and went anyway, one man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many, and the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. have the flag up here and I would like for you to stand right now and before our national anthem we're going to say the pledge of allegiance ready begin I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all Please remain standing. Marissa is going to come. The presentation. Thank you. You may be seated just for a moment because we want to also honor those that have served our country and uh, in the military, and we thank you as well. First of all, 
If you've had a loved one that died in battle, the keeping our country free, uh, a family member, uh, if you've had a family member that has died in battle, keeping our, our country free, would you just stand right there? St stand right now, wherever you're at. And uh, if you've had a family member, uh, uncle, or uh, uh, some relative that died in battle, I know that we have, and uh, thank God for that. If you've, thank you so much. And if you've served this country in the military and uh, maybe in the, the Marines, the Air Force, uh, whatever branch of service, would you stand? We want to recognize you and thank you for your service. Let's give a great applause to these men. Before you're seated, real quick, give us the uh, branch of service in the year that you served. I'm the uh, 66. All right, Robin. Yes, sir. Bruce. 87. 87. You can't be. You're not that old. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for your service. Uh, let's see. George. Uh, Jim. Good. Bill. Thank you for your service. Yes, Robert. Amen. Amen. Let's give these men a nice applause again and thank him for their service to this country. Let's stand all together now. Our worship team is going to come and lead us and uh, let's uh, praise God for all that he's done for us.
God. Well, the battle belongs to Him. Before we pray, a number of prayer requests have come in. Let's uh, remember those uh, affected by the shootings in uh, Uvalde, Texas. I can imagine what those parents are going through, and the heartbreak, the heartbreak of these last number of days. Um, folks, we need God in this country so bad. We need the Lord. We also want to remember today, and we got this request in Pastor Mike, uh, one of his church planters uh, down in Irvine, Igor Shukov. Uh, his brother today was killed this morning in Ukraine, in, uh, in the front lines in Ukraine uh, just this morning. So remember this pastor and his family that uh, lives here in Irvine and Orange County, remember them in prayer. Let's continue to remember Erica in prayer that uh, God might continue to bless her and be with her. Also remember today, our, my neighbor, uh, his mother is uh, uh, in hospice right there uh, next door and uh, not expected to live. And so let's remember that family in prayer as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And we're so thankful for, Lord, the freedoms that we have in this country. Lord, we've got our difficulties, sure. We've got our problems, that's for sure. But dear Lord, we also praise you because, Lord, we can still preach the gospel. And Lord, uh, I pray that we'll continue to have those freedoms. Today, the Lord, our hearts are heavy because of those that are grieving today in Texas. Oh God, put charms of love around those precious families and loved ones that have to bury those children and those two teachers. God, meet their need today. I pray as well, dear Lord, for this dear church planter here in Irvine that got news today that his own brother killed in the front lines in Ukraine this morning. God, just comfort his heart, this preacher's heart. I pray, dear Lord, for Erica today. I pray for my neighbor, Bob, and, and uh, Lord, and Liz, and their family today. Put your arms of love around them, Lord. And then there are others today that are here that perhaps, uh, Lord, that have a heavy heart, heavy burden. I pray for our shut-ins today that are watching online. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll just be with them. And Lord, bring them strength in their body, that they'll be able to come back and worship here at Liberty. We love you and praise you. May this be a day Dear Lord, you change our lives and change our hearts. We'll give you glory and praise for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Remain standing as we continue in our worship. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the dark.
Thank you, praise team. Remain standing just for a moment. Remain standing just for a moment. Take your copy of the Word of God. Thank you, praise team. And, and uh, Marissa, thank you for singing today. And uh, we'll make sure that microphone is right the next time you do that. All right. Take your Bibles. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 before you're seated. I want to just share two passages, one here in 2 Timothy and the other in Romans chapter 13. But in 2 Timothy... Uh, chapter 3. Well, by the way, right now we'll go ahead and allow our boys and girls, third grade and younger, to go ahead and go back to Children's uh, Church there with Brother Frenchy. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want you to know this, just the first five verses of this passage. But this, but know this, excuse me, that in the last days perilous or difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away." And then if you would please over to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, and uh, Paul writing this to the church at Rome and says in chapter 13 and verse 1, let every soul be subject to the gov governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. May God add His blessing on His word. You may be seated. 
We're so glad you're here today and uh, praying for those that are traveling today, even with the price of gas going up and up and up. And uh, I saw it in, on the way to church this morning, from yesterday to today, some of those gas stations are still rising their prices. Aren't you glad you're in church today? Amen. And um, uh, how many would rather be here than anywhere else in the world right now? That's, that's where, I, other than heaven. All right, other than heaven. All right. Back in second, uh, the, the title of the message this morning is How to Live in These Difficult Days. And all we know that we, we all face those perilous, difficult times today. Notice in chapter 2, or, ch or chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul tells Timothy to know this in verse 1. He says, I want you to have an understanding of this. And what then he does, he li then lists the realities of, these fa of the fallen world that awaits the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this, until that day comes, there will be perilous times, difficult times. Now that times there, the word, is not talking about your watch or a calendar of times, but epics of times or eras of time, a an increase of severity or an increase of frequency. So there will be epic times in our life, dangerous times, stormy times, uh, 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 stressful times. And if you, do have, if you uh, have not realized it today, these are difficult days, we, unprecedented days. We, we've not, those that are a little bit older, those that have gray hair or blonde hair like mine, or no hair, all right, you understand that we as a nation have not faced some of these things and, and the frequency of some of these things. And, um, and, and, and how do they come? What's why the problem? Well, verse 2 says, notice, uh, uh, verse 2, people, men, sinful people who live these corrupt lives will create such perilous, difficult times. Here we've had this week the shootings in in Texas, we, two weeks ago in a grocery store in Buffalo, we've, we've got sexual perversion that's running rampant and uh, that, that just, it's just unbelievable what's happening there. It's, we've got government corruption and on and on and on. You say, Pastor, what's a Christian supposed to do? We live in a country that was founded on biblical principles and Judeo-Christian uh, uh, principles. How do we respond as Christian citizens? What are we to do? I mean, it seems like this country's just gone to the point of no return. Folks, as uh, our duty as Christians and our responsibility as believers is to realize this. If, 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 if God ordained government, People will say this, that, that, uh, that we shouldn't get involved. But do you realize if God ordained government, would He tell us as God's people then not to get involved what He ordained? Some say, well, Pastor, again, there's absolutely no hope for America. I mean, it's a point of, of no return. And we think of government, we think of politics, we think of what we see in, in Sacramento and, and Washington, D.C. We think, boy, it's so dirty and rotten. And if we get involved as believers and if we get any closer to that, I, I don't know about you, sometimes I feel like, boy, we just would defile ourselves because of the leaders, you know, that make promises and say one thing and the bickering that we see going on, even with an nation. Some have been so intimidated by organizations like the ACLU that, uh, who say, oh, listen, Christians, you can't participate, you can't get involved because of the separation of church and state. They say the church should just stay out of the, the, and go back to their stained glass buildings and stay out of it. They think Christians have no rights whatsoever. And so this morning, I want to take a look at what, how, why God established government. What's our responsibility as Christian citizens in this country? First of all, I want you to notice in Romans chapter 13, the Bible tells us that governments are ordained of God. Look at verse 1. Let me read it again. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority, no government, except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. It's interesting, hang on to Romans, but go back to the book of Daniel, if you would, please. In the Old Testament, right after the book of Ezekiel, you find Daniel 
in Daniel chapter 2, notice what he says there. He not only brings governments in, and, and uh, they're ordained of God, but well, let me tell you, folks, the Bible tells us that God raises up leaders and brings them down. Notice in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21 what it says. It says, He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And so what, what God does, say, God says, listen, I, I rise up kings and I take them down. God set up kings like Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked king. Yet Daniel had the opportunity to tell him, Dan, Dan, Daniel said, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, here's where your power comes from. Look at over there in verse 30, same chapter, Daniel chapter 2. Look at verse 37. Here's what it says. Daniel chapter 2. He says, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Here's what he's saying. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the only reason you've got power is because God gave it to you. Nebuchadnezzar was an ungodly leader. He was so full of himself at the end of his life that he ended up crawling around on all fours like an animal eating grass. See, God raised him up, and then guess what God did? He brought him down. I think of Pharaoh, another leader in the scriptures, another wicked king, murder of little babies. What did God do? God brought him down. Pilate was a, in the New Testament, was a weak politician, didn't have the moral courage to release Jesus. Instead, he said, I'll just wash my hands of it. And yet, Jesus said in John 19, 11, Jesus said to Pilate, actually, you could have no power at all against me unless it was given you from above. See, we realize that Scripture tells us that government comes from the Lord. And God gave us a couple of reasons for government and, and authorities. First of all, if you go back to uh, Romans, you find that its government was given by God to restrain evil. Now, let me just say this. There's no law that America can make, that our legislature can make, to the make you moral, make you good. No law can make you honest. And so that's why there's laws to keep you and to keep people in this country from stealing. Laws can't make you good. Only God, by the way, only the Lord can make you good. Amen. Government is there to do what? To restrain evil. The second thing, the, 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 the reason God gave us government, verse 3 of Romans 13, our founding fathers believed in, in this and they believed in the Word of God. They wrote this. That government is to promote, listen to this, because it's biblical. They wrote that government is to promote the great general welfare and provide for the common defense. Where'd they get that? Romans 13. They got that from the Word of God. It's amazing to me in the New Testament, religious leaders were always trying to trap Jesus with these different political questions and so forth. Uh, one of the questions was about uh, the... the uh, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said, you know this verse. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. What was he saying? Folks, that's, that's the key to understanding our responsibility as believers and Christians. Now see, the world tells us, oh, you know, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. Folks, that doesn't mean that we cannot get involved as Christians. Let me just say this. That's not in the Constitution. Amen, Pastor. All my ameners are on vacation this weekend. <laughs> That's not in the Constitution. That was a phrase that Thomas Jefferson used in writing a letter to the Danbury Baptist Church in Danbury, Connecticut. We've been there, haven't we, Jed? We've seen it. We've seen well, the church. We rode right down next to it. And it was a place that he wrote that, uh, that, that the government is not going to have power over the church. And that's what it meant. And now it's got all twisted. And, 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 and uh, it's all twisted up. Here's what the Constitution says. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. See, these founders, you see, were they all Christians, all believers? No, many of them were. They were deists, they believed in God, but most of them believed the Bible was the Word of God. 
And they knew that our rights come from God and not government. See, government must be free to restrain evil. And so the church, Christians, we're, we're, is it, we're not a servant to the government or to the state or a master of the state. Folks, we ought to be a con, the conscience of the state. We ought to, they ought to be concerned about God's people. And they ought to be concerned that God's people are praying and fasting for this country to get it back on the right track. So since we're in perilous, difficult times, this epic period of time, what are our duties as Christians? First of all, here's what the Bible says. All right? I'm going to cover a few of them, and then kind of park there for one of them, all right, and stay there for a little while. First of all, the Bible says we're to pay for our government. Go over to, again, Romans 13, go down to verse 7, look at it, render therefore to all their due, Romans 13, 7, taxes to whom taxes are due. I didn't hear anybody say amen there. <laughs> customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. We pay taxes. Everybody pays taxes. We, in my opinion, pay too many. You can go ahead and say amen there. <laughs> taxes can be a burden, can't they? But I, I, I like the roads that we draw, drive by. I, I like having lights in our, down in our street. I like some of the things that government provides for. I'm glad that we have a strong military that provides strength. By the way, peace through strength, I've always believed that. That we don't have other countries coming and bombarding and, and, uh, and invading our country. And so we pay taxes. Now, taxes can be a burden. And taxes, and excessive taxes, I think are, are sinful and very dangerous. See, taxes can be such a burden, especially when we, we have those that can work but don't, won't work, be, and they want everybody else to pay for everything. Amen? But we pay for some things. We pay our taxes. We've got to keep John, John Wallace busy on those tax seasons. Amen. 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 He, amen. Boy, he, he almost put hand, two hands out there. That one. We've got to pay for it. We also have to pray for our government. You say, Pastor, I didn't vote for that, that scoundrel. I didn't, I didn't vote for that wicked person. More reason to pray. You say, how should we pray? Pray, oh God, America deserves judgment, but we, but we need mercy. Pray that God would bring this nation uh, and, and they would get back to the things of God. That Pray that, 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 uh, that God, we, just, we need you in America again. We need you in our schools. We need you in our government. We need you in every institution that we have. Our greatest responsibility, again, is not who's in the White House, but whether or not those in the church house and those in Christian houses are praying and fasting for their leaders. I'm talking about praying for our local leaders. I'm talking about we got big elections coming here in California. A lot of times we as conservatives say, oh, you know, it's, we, 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 don't, we don't have the votes anymore. But folks, all politics are local. And these local things are supervisors and city council and, and, uh, and, and school boards are so important today. Amen, Pastor. We need to pray for uh, 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 those that uh, are, in, are in state government in, in, in Sacramento. Uh, by the way, thank the Lord for those that responded last week. We saw that, that bill, that change that we shared with you last week. Thank God for those that responded to that. But we have, we have the responsibility and the command of God to pray for our leaders. You say, I didn't vote for them. It doesn't matter. I pray for a lot of people I don't vote for. We're to vote for them. All right, so we're to pay for them. We're to pray do you know the Bible actually says a third thing we're to do? And it says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Let me just read it. You can turn to it. We're to praise our government. Sometimes that's tough, amen? Here's what it says. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. And honor the king. For quick little commands just in that one verse. 
Now, let me just say this. It's, it's difficult at times when leaders do wrong. It's difficult at times to praise leaders when they go against the Word of God. Amen? And yet, sometimes we have to... You say, I don't like the personality. But folks, we have to recognize their position, not necessarily their personality. And so we honor those in leadership o- over us. Um, so we pay for the government. We pray for it. We praise it. But guess what else we're supposed to do? We're to preach it. We're to preach to the government. Now, let me just park it. This is the one I'm going to park on a little bit. Because I'm going to tell you how and what we're supposed to be doing. Listen, folks, you and I as God's people cannot be silent. We've got to tell this. We've got to tell this. All these political parties, we've got to tell the whole country, Republicans, Independents, Democrats, to repent and get right with God. We've got to pray that way. We've got a world of, le- we got leaders today that are so anti-God, anti-family. I'll never forget the, that I was, uh, a number of years ago, went to Nebraska. They called a number of pastors in, uh, a couple of thousand from all over the country to go to Nebraska because there was a preacher there that had a Christian school that uh, refused to take a license from the state because he felt that licensure meant control. And he, uh, he thought he had a, a Sunday school. He had a, he had a Sunday school on Sunday and he had a Monday through Friday school as well. And uh, so uh, if he didn't have to take a license on Sunday, he didn't think he had to take a license on Monday. He fought that thing. He lost, ended up in, ended up in jail. And so thousands of preachers came all over the country. And I'll never forget my assignment with two other preachers was to go and talk to the most liberal politician in the state of Nebraska at that time. Now they had a, bicam- a, 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 a bicameral uh, legislature, but this was the, this leader was, he, they, everybody said he's the most liberal. I said, thanks for, thanks for giving me the most liberal guy. We went in there as nicely and civilly as we could, and we began to talk about the family and children and, uh, and, and education. And he actually made this statement. He said, I know you preachers are going to disagree with me. He said, but let me tell you, the children of this that, uh, that live here in the state of Nebraska belong to the state. I ser- said, sir, I put in my finger. I said, they do not. They belong to God and the parents that God has entrusted to them. See, we got to preach sometimes to the state, to government. Nathan counseled David. Elijah in the Old Testament confronted Ahab. Eliezer warned Jehoshaphat. Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. Moses warned Pharaoh. John the Baptist preached, he he preached uh, to to Herod. Okay, pastor, I, I realize, but what's our message? Glad you asked. Here's the message that God's people have got to do and got to preach. Whatever is morally wrong and biblically wrong, folks, is not politically uh, uh, right. Whatever is gone against this Word of God and, and morally and biblically wrong is not politically right. We know Scripture says or, that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We have, God's people have to take a stand. See, as long as the government says it's legal to kill babies and to practice infanticide, which our state almost came to that point in that bill last, last week. Do you realize since 1973, Roe versus Wade, 44 million babies have been aborted and murdered in the womb. Now I realize the leak that happened in the Supreme Court just uh, a few weeks ago has, has literally sent shockwaves across this country to the liberal crowd because, listen, they, they want to go against the Word of God. Life begins at conception. We have a, my nephew, a young man, a young preacher that's going to be give, sharing his testimony Not only when he got saved, but how God provided a a brand new third baby for them just a few months ago. A mom that was a a drug addict was going to abort the baby. They found out about it. They talked her out of it, prayed with her. 
And she said, okay, if you'll adopt my child, I'll go ahead and have it. A mother that was ready to abort the, the baby, right now, her name is Bethany Beagle. And thank God for it. You're going to be hearing that story and uh, in, uh, you men in a couple of weeks in our men's stakeout. I want to show you some things. You see, what does really, really the Bible say about life? I'm glad you asked that too. Go over to Psalm chapter 139, if you would please. Psalm, notice what the psalmist said. Psalm 139. And look at verse 13. He says this about life. For, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me tell you, aren't you glad God made us and we're fearfully, we're wonderfully made. And notice what he says. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being formed yet, uh, uh, being yet unformed. And, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. And, and it goes on and on and on. Let me give you another one. Go over to the book of Jeremiah. Notice in Jeremiah, in, uh, let's see, in chapter, uh, chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1, and notice what it says there, Jeremiah chapter 1, and uh, begin reading in verse number 4, Jeremiah chapter 1, ver uh, verse 4, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you, Jeremiah, as a prophet to the nations. Go over to the Gospel of Luke. See what it says in the New Testament on the issue of life. And these are just a few scriptures in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Notice what it says here in Luke chapter 1. And uh, let's see, go down to verse number 41. Luke chapter 1 and verse 41. All right, here it is. He says, and talking about Zacharias and, and Elizabeth, and it came and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, the baby, leaped in her womb. Listen, if God calls her a baby, it's a baby. Scientific people today say, well, we got to follow the science. We've heard that in the last two years with, co uh, with, with COVID. Folks, follow the science, the heartbeat of a baby, the, the, what happens, uh, uh, the, the baby, uh, uh, Lord, uh, uh, notice it says that the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Folks, we've got to preach to this world today that life is precious from the womb to the tomb. So we've got to do it as long as government says it's okay and legalizes that, practices and fantasies. We've got to preach, it, preach to the government when it tries to normal, normalize sexual perversion contrary to the Word of God. I don't have to tell you that what's happening today in America. We've got, we've got young people that are so confused and in sexual identity today. Let me tell you, friend, in Genesis chapter 127, man is created in the image of God, the Bible says. And he says in that verse that God created male and female, period, not plus. You say, well, we're just all one sex today. It's just all one and just whatever you want, whatever. Listen, we have become as gods determine what is right and wrong in our own eyes. And it doesn't matter if the world does it or family members think differently than you. Folks, take a stand with the Word of God when it comes to the to the home and families. God still made a one man, one woman marriage for a lifetime. 
When asked about certain things, see, uh, the definition of marriage, God always went back in Matthew chapter 19 and, and Mark's gospel, the same thing. What did he do? He went back and Jesus said, you go back to the Old Testament, look at the original plan for marriage, one woman, man, one woman for a lifetime, and any deviation from that is wrong. It's wrong. We cannot be silent. And I know I'm an old preacher today. I've been doing this a long time. But folks, until God gives me my last breath, I'm going to keep preaching it the way it is. I know that there are many in the pulpit today who don't even talk on these issues anymore. You say, Pastor, does, does the Bible say much about homosexuality? Yes, it does. Look at it. Go to the Old Testament, and then I'll show you a couple of verses in the New. We looked at it on Wednesday night a little bit. On Levit Leviticus, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. We got it. We're going to stick with the Word of God. People say, well, pastor, you know, just as long, here's, here's the world's definition, just as long as they love each other. It doesn't matter who it is, but it, the whole main thing is their love. Folks, the main thing is they do it biblically. Leviticus 18, look at verse 22. He says, And you shall not lie with male as a woman. It is an abomination. The Bible's very clear. Go over two more pages here in your Bibles, chapter 20 of Leviticus, and look at verse 13. If a man lies, Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 20, verse 13, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. The Bible is very, very clear. Go over to the New Testament and notice in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And notice what the Bible tells us. Uh, and I told our folks on Wednesday night in our Bible study that we are now basically living in a Romans 1 uh, culture today, it seems like. Romans chapter 1. And notice in verse number 26, Romans chapter 1 and verse 26. If you're there, say amen. It says, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now go over to 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. Notice Paul writing to this church at Corinth, trying to straighten them out on many different issues. And in chapter 6, he began to tell them about some of the things that were part of the church and how that used to be part of their life. In 1 Corinthians chapter... I'm, I'm, here, I'm in 2 Corinthians. No wonder that didn't look right. All right. Chapter 6. All right. Look at verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, adulterers, uh, uh, idolaters, uh, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. God's pretty clear on it, isn't He? Old Testament, New Testament. By the way, don't quit reading. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. See, this church of Corinth was made up of ex-idolaters, ex-adulterers, ex-fornicators, ex-homosexuals. This church was where, uh, where all the exes got together, amen? And they weren't in Texas. You say, Pastor, I don't know what's so funny about that. Ask some of your country uh, Western friends, all right. And some were such of you, and, but you are washed. You're sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit, uh, and by the Spirit of our God. Aren't you glad that God can change lives? That's why we've got to preach to this world. That's why we've got to preach to not just the government. I'm talking about to the culture that we're living in today. We've got to preach. Listen, we cannot be silent. Be civil, yes, but not silent. Marriage today. 
young people and, and couples getting married and ending up in divorce and so many problems today with homes and families. You heard about the, the, uh, uh, the couple that had been married for a number of years and she loved NASCAR and for, Formula One racing. How many NASCAR fans? Any NASCAR fans? No, no uh, one person. All right, good. She loved, uh, she loved fast cars and loved racing and that. And uh, her birthday was coming up, and, and uh, he said, uh, sweetheart, what can I get you for your birthday? She says, well, she says, honestly, honey, what I want is something that can go from zero to 180 in about eight seconds. Well, a week lit passed, and here came her birthday. And he went in, and he said, honey, he said, I got a birthday present for you. He said, it's out in the parking lot with a bow on it. She was so excited, she, she drew those uh, curtains away. She looked out, and it was a scale to weigh yourself. <laughs> Some of you have heard that one before. All right. Needless to say, that marriage didn't last probably very long. We've got a message to proclaim. We've got marriages and families messed up today. We're living in a period of time, an epoch of time, an era of time. Perilous, difficult, seeing all sorts of things, rights, wrong, wrongs, right. The last thing as Christians we need to do is participate in our government. Our government is is of the people, by the people, for the people. And we've got to get informed, and let me tell you, every Christian ought to vote. Amen, Amen Pastor. And every Christian, ought, again, ought to pray. And there, even some run for office. That'd be good. Some of you ran for, for office. If God, or listen, if our God ordained government then tells us as God's people to stay out, you think you'd do that? then guess what? Who's going to run it? The, the, the people that don't believe this book. The crazy people. <laughs> I'll, I, I, let's face it, we got some crazy people out there making some crazy decisions. We've got to get... Here, here's what it is. We've we got to get the gospel into the public square. Now, we're not going to do it basically just by debating and arguing to the lost. They're, they're morally lost. They're, they're, they're blind to a lot of things. They don't see. They have, the world today, many people today, have no moral compass whatsoever. I mean, no people. They have no moral compass. I mean, it's just they don't understand right and wrong whatsoever. So what are we to do, folks? They've got to, they've got to know Jesus. The bottom line is the gospel message again. The Bible tells us work to persuade people to do what? Winning them back one at a time, bringing them back to Christ. And it's not, listen, it's not political influence that we need. It's the power and the mercy of God that we need today in this world. God bring us revival. I pray for it. For my children and my grandchildren. These are difficult days. Yes, they are. But remember, Folks, we have a message to proclaim, and the message needs to go out one person at a time. Who's the person? Who's your one that this week you could share the gospel with and perhaps even see them come to Christ? With their heads bowed this morning. I wonder today, you say, Pastor, I love the Lord today. And I want to, I make this commitment to God that I am going to pray more for my leaders and my government. I'm going to pray for them and uh, more than I ever have in the past. I've neglected to do that. Would you lift your hand and say, yes, I make that commitment to the Lord. I'm going to pray more for my leaders, the leaders in this country, locally, statewide, county-wise. We've got supervisors that are running. We've got we got a lot of people that are running for different... I, I'm going to pray more for our leaders. Also today, you say, Pastor, there are some lost people. There, I've got some lost family members 
or people that are away from God, their moral compass has just been skewed. They, they used to believe it and used to take a stand on stuff and family members and friends and it's just hard to fellowship. It's just hard to today to even talk. And I pray that God will open up those lines of communication and I want to pray for those today. God's put a burden in my heart for somebody that needs Jesus. God's put a burden in my heart for a family member that needs the Lord. Would you lift your hand and say, yes, that's my desire today. I've got family. I've got people that I love and care about that need change, that need the power of God, that need, need God in their life. They're going the wrong way. They're going the wrong way. Lord, you know our hearts. Lord Jesus today, Bless America. Bring revival. Have mercy on us today. We need you in our country. And Lord, we, we understand that you create, you raise leaders up, you bring them down. But Lord, you have commanded us as well to, to do some things. But one of the greatest things to do is to share the gospel. Lay that person in our heart even this week that we'll be able to share the gospel. Lord, we've got some family members that are just turned their backs on the, the Word of God, on morality, on things that they know better. God, today we pray for them. Our hearts are burdened for them. We love you. We pray that you'll take care of this invitation. Meet every need in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. If you're here today and don't know Christ, you're watching online, don't know Christ, receive Jesus today. We'll have someone come and share from the Word of God how you can be saved. If today you just want to come and pray about some family member, some friend that's lost, that just lost, and you love them and you just want to come and pray for them, you come right now. Janelle, lead us in this song. Whatever area of need, you come as we sing. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a dream from the well? Jesus is called. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Today there is no reason to wait, but Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and train them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. You may be seated. We're glad to have you in our service this morning and this holiday weekend. And uh, pray for those that are traveling and uh, out of town. And, and I know Pastor Art and his family on vacation, others that are gone this weekend. But let's continue to pray for God's people. By the way, if men, and you'll hear it in the Liberty in 90 seconds, pray for Chris 
again, and uh, he got COVID another time. And so he's home, tested positive, mild symptoms, but we pray for him. And uh, so you'll see somebody different on the Liberty in 90 Seconds today. But men, please make sure that you get your tickets today. See uh, uh, Junior or Steve outside at the table after the service. Next week we'll be honoring all of our Wana kids and our workers and looking forward to a great Sunday. And then of course uh, on Father's Day coming up in just a couple of weeks, we're going to honor uh, all of our dads and grads. Lots of things going on. Lots of things. But if you're visiting today, take a visitor's card from one of the pockets there in front of you. Put your name and address on there. And uh, then in a moment, as our ushers come by with, uh, with the offering, just put that in the offering basket. We appreciate that so much. Let's continue to give as God has blessed us. And uh, stay faithful to the Lord. Stay faithful in your stewardship. Stay faithful. By the way, we, here's what we do. This is the rule here at Liberty. We give you one Sunday a, a year for a vacation. So... Two if you're stretching it. So some of you are already taking it. You know, with, with COVID, if we, get once the, if we get both Sundays show up a good, good, uh, on, the, on the same Sunday, we have a good crowd. We got every other group crowd. So uh, let's stay faithful to the summer months. Amen. Be in church. This vid, the, 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 uh, the reason we still do uh, online streaming is for our shut-ins and uh, those that cannot be here on that, those areas. And so please be in church. It's, it's encouragement. Part of the koinea is God's people. And that is, and that is, there's see one thing watching it online, but the koinea is what we need as God's people. Amen. That's fellowship. And, uh, and, uh, and it's an encouragement to other believers, encouragement to this preacher. Stay faithful in your growth and serve the Lord uh, even in our summer months. Ushers, would you come? Let's receive the Lord's tithe and offering. And uh, again, let's be faithful in our giving, in our stewardship, and uh, believe God. If you're not a giver, start. God will change your heart. You'll be excited and see how God will work a miracle in your life and open up the windows of heaven. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to give now. Bless, dear Lord, these offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Liberty Church. It's Frenchie, and I'm here with Liberty in 90 Seconds. So listen, June 5th, we are so excited to celebrate our Awana students. They have worked so hard this entire year. And so listen, we want you to be here on June 5th to celebrate these students and then celebrate the teachers that worked so hard to make sure our students were growing in the Lord. Also, men, June 11th, the steak is coming. That's right. Listen, today is the last day for you to pay for your steak dinner. Now listen, it's only $15. If you want to buy a couple extra tickets, today is the day. Invite a friend. We look forward to seeing you for the men's steak out. June 19th, the day to remember. Listen, we want to celebrate our grads and our dads. Um, you guys have worked so hard throughout the year and fathers, we just love you. And so we have a special gift for every single one of you guys at that service at June 19th. Last but not least, we want to celebrate on July 3rd, Patriotic Sunday. Uh, God has blessed us to live in this amazing country. We want to celebrate it with you. And we're going to have some fun activities for the kids, some bouncers, some water slides. But the best part is the food. We're having a church-wide potluck and we need your help. If your last name begins with the letters A through M, we need you to bring a main dish. If your last name begins with the letters N through Z, maybe a salad or a dessert. We hope you've enjoyed your service and that you have a blessed week. All right, let's stand together, and uh, let's see, uh, 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 John, let's see, John, come on up here, John Wallace, and uh, dismiss us in prayer, and uh, thank the Lord for Brother John. Is this one on? Yeah, there we, there we go. John, thank you. Would you dismiss us in prayer? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for just being in the house of worship this morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, that we've been reminded of our duty and obligation as a citizen and as a Christian, oh, Heavenly Father, with respect to government. Father, we ask that you just bless us as we have heard your word this week, that your word would continue to be that lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway, to give us guidance and, and encouragement as we go through this week. We ask this thing, these things in Jesus Christ's name, his name we do pray. Amen. And praise God.